Now that we've talked about folds and faults and earthquakes and stress and strain of rocks, we're going to look at the other major effect that plate tectonics has on the lithosphere, and that is the creation of volcanoes. Volcanoes can be very powerful geologic events. Some of them can be as powerful or more powerful than the explosion of an atom bomb. And we'll see examples of these in this in the next lecture. Other volcano, volcanic eruptions can happen um, all the time, and people living near them aren't as affected by them as they would have been by one of those explosive atomic bomb size eruptions. So the main cause of most volcanic eruptions and most volcanoes is plate tectonics and the movement of the tectonic plates. And if you think about it and think back, most of this happens in those subduction zones, which is where one plate goes underneath another one and melts and becomes what is called magma, or molten liquid rock. This magma makes its way up to the Earth's surface, and when magma hits the Earth's surface, we call it lava. And all of this, again, is caused by plate tectonics, which is caused by Earth's inner heat from the cores, and this is that whole idea of the convection cell, the hot rising spreading over and cooling, the sinking, and then the heating before it starts to rise again, the convection cells. Magma itself is, like I said, it's liquid rock, or molten, molten rock. All right, molten for melted, it's melted rock. And it is produced underneath the Earth's surface, when magma comes onto surface, we change its name to lava. And magma can form in a few different ways. One of these ways is, is pretty easy. The temperature of the rock gets so high that it's above the melting point of the rock, and so the rock melts. That's, that's pretty easy. It's like an ice cube. You put an ice cube out under or over 32 degrees Fahrenheit, over 0 degrees Celsius, that solid ice melts, because it's at a temperature above its melting point. The second way a rock can melt is if a lot of pressure is removed. All right, As pressure gets removed, matter can change form. So if you look at, like, say, a bottle of Pepsi, or a bottle of Coke, and it you can kind of feel the pressure pushing out on it as you try to squeeze it. And then as soon as you open it, all these bubbles seem to come out of nowhere, the carbonation. Well, what happens is when it's sealed and pressurized, and you can feel that extra pressure, all the carbon dioxide is in liquid form inside the Coke or the Pepsi. Then you unleash the cap, which is releasing the pressure, and all of or not all of, but a lot of that carbon dioxide changes from a liquid to a gas and comes out. Well, the same can happen with rock, except it goes from a solid to a liquid. So pressure can help keep something a solid when it is way above its melting point if there's enough pressure. Think of the Earth's inner core. It's super hot in the Earth's inner core, but there's the pressure of the rest of the Earth around it causing the rock there to stay solid. The final way of rock becoming magma or of magma forming is the addition of fluids, specifically water. And think back to those subduction zones happening under the ocean. You got the rock going down, but what's on that rock? Well, wet mud and silt and and sand, and so there's water in there, and that can decrease the overall melting point of some of the minerals or of even the rock itself and cause the rock to melt. So you got these three ways. Um, the first way, which is the, the obvious one, where the temperature goes above the melting point. The second one 
has to do with removing pressure, and the third one is you're adding fluids like water. After the rock melts, a process called volcanism may form. And volcanism is anything, any activity that allows magma to move onto or toward Earth's surface. So the magma's moving up towards the Earth. And as soon as that magma hits the surface, we call it lava. Lava is the name for magma on the surface. Just magma on Earth. A volcano itself is a vent. It's a crack, a fissure, a hole. All right, we got crack, hole. All right, a vent or a fissure in Earth's surface, and it's where magma, which when it hits Earth's surface, magma becomes lava, and gases are expelled or released. So magma rises up through the rock, through the crust, because it is less dense. And it is less dense because it is hotter than the surrounding rock. And remember, most things become less dense as they get hotter. It's why the steam rises out of your shower. Well, like earthquakes, we can see lots of volcanoes in very specific zones. And a lot of these zones overlap each other. All right, Mainly we find them near convergent and divergent boundaries. The convergent boundaries have subduction, and the divergent boundaries have the formation of rifts, called rifting. And the most common zone, or the, the biggest zone of uh, active volcanoes, circles the Pacific Ocean, and it is called the Pacific Ring of Fire, sometimes just called the Ring of Fire. And it has to do all with subduction of various oceanic plates underneath the North American, South American, or Eurasian plates. So right here, here is the picture of the Ring of Fire. Every single red dot on here represents an active volcano. Alright, where do we see most of them? Right around the Pacific Ocean. Alright, along the uh, Andes Mountains in South America, through uh, Mexico and Central America. And then right in here where California is, we don't see a lot of volcanoes. But we don't have subduction happening there at this little spot. If you remember, this is the San Andreas Fault, which is labeled right here. And so that's a transform boundary at that little part. As you start moving more north and um, North America, where the Cascades are, and Mount St. Helens, we got that Juan de Fuca plate going underneath the North American plate causing subduction. The Aleutian Islands, all across those, bi those bi big long chain of islands coming off of Alaska, those are all volcanic islands, as is Japan. Japan is what is called an island arc. There are, um, I think, four main islands of Japan that each have at least a vol one volcano on them. As you go through Indonesia um, and Southeast Asia here, we have lots of volcanoes. Again, some of the biggest volcanoes ever are occurring right in here in the, the Java area between a couple of islands. Um, one, of, one such volcano, or a famous one from there, was called Krakatoa and could be heard miles and miles away when it exploded in the 1800s. And there's a new volcano growing there right now. The main thing from this is to notice all of these volcanoes around the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ring of Fire. All right. We have Hawaii, which is a, this little volcano in the middle of a plate, which is kind of weird. It's called a hot spot. We'll talk about those a little later. And then up here and along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we see a lot of volcanoes, and especially up in Iceland. And Icelands are kind of weird, because you would think that they'd be like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge volcanoes, where they're 
the plates are spreading apart, they wouldn't be too bad. But Iceland also has glaciers sitting on top of the volcanoes, acting kind of like a, uh, a lid on a pot of boiling lava. Well, as you saw in that last picture, most of the volcanoes were located around subduction zones. And we're going to focus mostly and mainly on those. And so if, if we had two plates, one of oceanic lithosphere, which is, remember, made of basalt, and one of continental lithosphere, which is made mostly of granite, the denser material, the basalt, the denser basalt gets pushed beneath or subducts under the continental lithosphere. And what we get is we get a deep trench forming right where this subduction starts. That is the first um, thing we see whenever we start dealing with Uh, subduction zone is, is we start to see this deep trench forming. Alright, so let's see, we have one plate here, and it's going to subduct under another one. Here's my other plate. The trench is right there. Right where the boundary is. And then the other thing we end up seeing is on the top plate right in this area is where we would see volcanoes. And right there is where we start to see a bunch of volcanoes, and that's because we have this plate subducts, it starts to form magma that moves up to the surface in volcanism. So as we have this ocean plate sinking, it sinks into the asthenosphere, all right, that plasticky hot layer, and fluids like water from the ocean, and also other materials from the ocean like sediment, combine with the crust and mantle, and it decreases the melting point. So remember, this is the third way to make magma. Add water and other stuff to it. Decreases the melting point of the rocks, and so we get the formation of magma, which then moves to the surface to create lava. Right, so that magma itself moves and breaks through. The magma breaks through the the upper um, the upper plate. Usually, it's another. It's a continental plate. Sometimes it's an oceanic plate, but usually continental plate. And we get something called an island arc, which is a string of volcanic mountains. All right, this is what Japan is. The Andes Mountains are a long chain of volcanic mountains. And it's usually perpendicular to the plane movement. So when we get back to, if, we, if you go back to the map, um, the South American and Nazca plates are moving east-west. The Andes Mountains run north-south. Same as the Pacific plates run, Pacific plate and Eurasian plate run east-west, Japan runs north-south. So it's a perpendicular series of mountains and volcanoes. All right, the more magma that reaches the surface, the larger the islands become, and if, if they join up enough, they can form present-day islands. And this is Japan. Japan is a bunch of volcanoes. Mount Fuji, the most iconic mountain in Japan, is a giant volcano. Here is just a beautiful picture of the subduction zone here. Right here is where our subducting plate is going. As it goes down, water from up here comes with it. The rock hits the athenosphere with that water and the sediment. It melts and then you can see right up here is where that magma gets up to the top. And we get a volcano. As that volcano erupts and produces more land mass, it might form to get an island. All right, our plates are moving on this screen, one to the left, one to the right. Our islands on this plane, or on this picture, are moving perpendicular. Here are the islands. All right, and I'll use green. Here are the plate motions. 
So we get that, that perpendicular movement. And the other big thing to see here is right where the two crusts are, crusts are hitting each other, we have a trench, a deep trench. So it's always trench and then over to the side are the volcanic islands or the volcanic mountains if it's happening more closer or happening closer to land. Mid-ocean ridges are another hot spot of, uh, I shouldn't use hot spot, another big place to find volcanoes where magma comes to the surface because of the moving part plates. Um, at these mid-ocean ridges, the magma erupts onto the surface, but not like the big booming eruptions. More, instead of erupts, we could use the word flows to form underwater volcanoes. And a lot of these eruptions, even though they're happening all the time, they go unnoticed because they're happening deep in the ocean. And we do not live deep in the ocean. We live on the surface of the land. So when we see a volcano on land, we get to see it. When, we, when it's happening a couple miles under the water, we, we usually don't get to see it. The final um, landform or geologic uh, neat thing that are made by volcanoes, or the other spot where we can find volcanoes, are known as hot spots. And even though these form islands, they're different from island arcs. The big thing about a hot spot is they are far away from a plate boundary. Right? They're usually in the middle of the plate. And what we have happening is um, a hot plume of mantle... All right, or a big chunk of, of mantle and magma rises and reaches the lithosphere. Eventually it breaks through. And as it breaks through, we get the islands. All right, now, keep in mind the plates are moving. All right, the plate moves. The plume is relatively stationary. So as the plate moves, this mantle plume is hitting a different spot on the plate, and so you can get a chain of islands. All right. Eventually, as the volcano on the surface is carried away, it stops, the activity stops, because the plume, the magma, is no longer beneath that volcano. And then a new volcano ends up forming onto the new spot. All right, and what we end up seeing is we see um, a parallel line of islands. All right, Hawaii, the Hawaiian islands have been formed in this way. And we got a picture to kind of sum it up. So, right here in red, there's the mantle plume. You can see all the little pockets of magma and lava coming up here. All right, present day Hawaii, the big island. There are four active volcanoes there being fueled by this plume. But then as you move farther away into Maui and Molokai and Oahu and, and so on, as you move further away, we have islands that are no longer getting bigger. The main Hawaiian island is growing because it's being fed by this um, hot spot, by, by this mantle plume. Whereas Maui, Molokai, Oahu, and the others, they're starting to shrink due to erosion from, from the waves. There are extinct volcanoes on there. You can find examples of the, the mountain, the landforms look a lot like modern day Hawaii, except without the magma. You can go to Hawaii and see magma flows. You can go to the edges and, and watch magma spill into the ocean. So it's coming up from the, uh, the plume. All right. Every now and then, magma crosses a street. Um, you can watch videos on it. Just search uh, magma flowing in Hawaii, and you'll have a ton of videos on the YouTube to kind of see, see examples of this. So these are hot spots. The plate is moving um, the direction of the arrow here, and if you look, that is the same direction of the islands. And as you get farther away 
from the modern day main island of Hawaii, as we keep going farther away, the islands were formed longer and longer ago. And the other thing we have happening here is they're starting to shrink because they're not growing and the forces of erosion are starting to take place. So that is pretty much the basics of volcanoes. In our last note section of this unit, we will be talking about eruptions and the different types of eruptions and what causes eruptions and what to expect when a volcano erupts and, and all that fun stuff. Have a good night.